I'm happy to introduce James Sagerwini. He's a software engineer working at Amazon Web Services, and he will present a talk with the title, Writing Redis in Python with Async I.O. Give him a hand, please. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, so as mentioned, my name is James Saryawini, and today I'm going to be talking about writing Redis in Python with async I.O. Uh, a little bit of background. The reason I started this project in the first place was um, really I just wanted to learn more about async I.O. I had heard a lot about it. <clears throat> um, you know, everyone was talking about it. I've, I've read the docs, but I didn't, really, I didn't really understand how we could use this to write something a little more realistic. And uh, at the time, I was familiar with Redis, and I thought, you know, Redis has some features that looks like it would be a really good fit for async.io, so I wanted to see how far I could take the idea. Um, so I started exploring writing Redis uh, in Python with async.io. And the reason I want to share this today is because I think there's some useful things that everyone here can take away from it. Um, <clears throat> I want to show how you can structure a larger network um, server application. That wasn't very obvious to me from reading the network, uh, the async IO documentation. And then I want to show you a couple of patterns that happen in Redis that I think apply in general to um, various types of network servers. So the basic request response structure, how that looks like, and then also a couple of other ones that are interesting. So publish, subscribe, and then blocking queues. So if you're familiar with Redis, this would be the BL pop and the BR pop, the blocking left pop and blocking right pop. Um, by the way, if you're not familiar with Redis, that's okay. I'm going to be explaining all of the specific features we're going to be implementing, so, so don't worry about that. Um, but I think that these patterns apply to, say, a chat server or into any kind of your own task queue or job queue. And I think in general, these would be um, generally applicable. Before we get started, though, uh, before we dive into it, I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, I'm not an async I.O. expert. Um, as I mentioned, I wanted to learn more about it. Uh, so a little bit about me. I, I work at AWS, and so I primarily work on, um, these are the libraries I primarily work on or have written a substantial portion of. Um, and the point of this, though, is that I am more, my area of expertise is in Python libraries and supporting multiple Python versions, that kind of thing. So writing an async I.O. network server that only runs on the latest version of Python is not something that um, I would consider myself an expert in. So I'm just a beginner trying to share what I have learned. Um, so without warning, uh, as much as I'm going to try to shoot for this, which is probably what the experts and the async I.O. maintainers would want us uh, to do, there's just a chance we might end up you know, with something like this or you know, something crazy like this. Um, so just as a warning. OK, so the one-minute introduction to Redis, uh, it is a data structure server. So it's a network server. You run it on a machine. You connect to it via sockets. And you send requests. It gives you responses. Um, the one thing that's kind of interesting is values can be more than strings. So you have your basic case here where you can set you know, foo and bar, and you get a value back. And then I can also get a value, um, and it'll give me that value back. But in addition to that, I can also have lists. So in this case, I can say r push, which is a write push onto the foo list, the value of a. So this is like foo.append uh, a in Python. And I can do that for three elements, a, b, and c. And then on the right-hand side, I can say l pop, which is left pop from foo. That's going to return me the first element, a. And then I can do l range from foo 0 to 2, which is basically a slice. So that's going to give me the elements um, from 0 to 2, which in this case is b and c, because we popped a previously. So that's the first thing I want to shoot for. Uh, and I'm going to look at how we can do a basic request response. So at the end of this first section, I want to be able to send a GET request, interpret it, figure out how this is going to work, and then send a response back. So I did, I think, what most people would do, start at the documentation. Um, if you haven't seen the documentation, this is the uh, async IO docs. You start at section 18.5.4.3.2, the obvious place to start, which is the TCP echo server protocol. Um, and so. I changed one line here, but this is essentially straight from the docs. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to be showing a lot of code here. Um, I'm going to highlight the specific parts that I think are interesting, but it's OK if you don't, uh, you don't have to follow or understand all of this. I'll, I'll put the slides online so you can look at it uh, more in detail later. But there's three parts to setting all this up. The first thing is we're going to do is create an event loop. We're going to then call create server and give us the Redis server protocol. So this is the class we're going to write. And this is going to give you all of the logic for handling the Redis protocol, parsing, figuring out how to call into our database, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then this will set up the listening sockets. The next thing we're going to do is call run forever. This will wait for uh, network I.O. and then call the appropriate things into our protocol. And we'll look, we'll look at that in a second. 
And then the last thing we're going to do is just clean up. So once we want to exit, we close down the server and call loop.close. But I want to look at this Redis server protocol. Um, I should mention real briefly that there's, I think, two other ways you can do this. You can use the low-level sockets in um, the async IO loop. And you can also use streams. Uh, streams are a little bit higher level. What I found is streams, while, while they were really nice to use, the performance for me was it was substantially slower, and I think protocols for me was a nice middle ground between um, still having fairly, being fairly expressive, but having um, pretty good performance. And I'll show some performance numbers at the end. So here's a protocol. So the idea is you have connection made, data received. Um, you get a transport for connection made, and then when data is available, you call data received. So I looked at this, and I kind of understood what it was doing. Um, I think that there's some um, history there from some of the other frameworks that influenced this, but um, I still didn't really get how protocols worked. And for me, uh, going one level deeper into async IO and trying to understand how all this works um, really helped illustrate for me. So I'm going to go kind of briefly into async IO code to understand how protocol and transports work, because that's really going to drive a lot of this implementation. So first thing, start with uh, the Redis server protocol. and in this loop, what's going to happen is whenever a connection's made, um, async IO, this, uh, notice in the top right, this is async IO slash selector events. So what's going to happen is you have a callback. Whenever a connection's made, you call accept uh, connection uh, two. Uh, and what's going to happen here is notice a protocol and transport are created for every connection. So every time you have a client connection, it's going to create a protocol and a transport. And this part here with the protocol factory, that was the Redis server protocol class we passed in. And notice it was a class object, not an instance. So it's going to call our class that's going to return an instance. But the main thing here is that there's one protocol and transport per connection. So if I had three clients connected, I would have three transport protocol pairs. Um, and the next thing now is let's see how connection made and data received are going to be called. So if I look at, um, this is the selector socket transport still in the async IO code. Um, when you create it, there's uh, this first line here, which is self.protocol.connectionmade. Connection made is a thing that we're going to write, and we can see how it's going to be called. Uh, the loop.call soon, I found that kind of confusing. It's really just loop.schedule this thing to be run or loop.add this to your to-do list of callbacks. But essentially what this is asking is for this method to be called and then the arguments to pass. So notice that the last argument is self, and the class we're in is the selector transport. So we'll see that again when we go back to our protocol class. The next thing here is uh, the read ready method. So again, another callback. And look at the last argument. It's read ready. And uh, we'll dive into what read ready is. Still in the async code. Again, just kind of showing you some highlights here. Uh, and the main part of this is this protocol.data received. Again, this is the method that we're going to write. So what's happening here is whenever there's data on a socket, we'll read from it via socket.receive and then call data received. So the main thing uh, here is that. Um, these are just callbacks, so they're not coroutines, they're not anything, you know, anything fancy like that. We just saw they're just simple callbacks that get scheduled whenever a new connection is made. And so if an event loop was like this, going from left to right, if I had four connections, as data comes in, I'm going to call data receive onto those protocols. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how protocols and transports uh, work. So we can start fleshing out the basic get and set response here. Um, this is how a more realistic data receive might look. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get data over the wire. We're going to call into our parser to parse the wire protocol. I'm simplifying things a bit, and I'll discuss that at the end. But we're going to parse uh, the wire protocol. And so this will give us, say, a list where the first element is the command set. Next one is a key. The next one is a value. And then once we do that, we're going to look at what command we were provided. And then after that, we'll call into the DB layers. So we'll say self.db.get and self.db.set. And we'll look at how that looks like. And then finally, after that, we're going to take our response, ask our serializer to serialize it to bytes, and then use transport.write. So a transport is really just an abstraction over a socket. It allows you to write data back to the client. So whenever we have something to send to our client, we say self.transport.write. And so this is the, the basic uh, overview for the first part. And also notice in connection made, I should mention, we're storing the transport. So that's how we're able to write back to that client. So it's one connection. And then just to give you some concrete data, this is, uh, you don't have to know what this is. This is the Redis serialization protocol. So it's a text-based format. This is just how it would actually look like. We'd get data over the wire that looks like this. Uh, star is like the list type, and it's three elements. And you can kind of see there's a set foo bar there. Uh, and then this is what we would return. So just to give you an idea of what we're actually sending back over the wire. OK, next thing, the DB class. So this is where all the logic happens for the Redis commands, like get and set and all the list manipulation. Uh, if you, as you can see here, it's just essentially an abstraction over a dictionary. 
But the main things here are that I found the DB being a separate module, so it doesn't know anything about async I.O. Um, that, that's really helpful. So you can imagine how you'd write a unit test for this, right? You create a DB, you call set foo bar, and then assert, you know, db.get is going to equal uh, bar. So, so very straightforward to test. Um, here's how some of the list commands would work. Um, again, just hopefully you can kind of just get the gist of this, right? For our push, we're essentially going to manipulate a list. For the L range we looked at, it's looking up that key and then slicing based on the start and stop. And same thing with LPOP or popping from the front of the list. By the way, you know, use uh, collections.dex so you get the constant time pop left. But um, just as an example, we're going to use a list here. And you can see how you can start to integrate that into the protocols here. So, you know, realistically, you'd probably extract this into a command handler class. But here I'm just adding if else statements here that are going to say, if it's our push, we're going to figure out how to construct the appropriate call into the database layer. And we keep that nice level, uh, that nice separation between the async code and our logic. Okay, so at this point, we've covered the basic stuff. We know how to get, um, we know how to respond to a get and a set and a list command. You could use this to flesh out the other types. So, uh, sorted sets, hashes, all that kind of thing. Um, you can get a lot of the commands implemented this way. But now I want to cover two more interesting cases that I think um, took me a while to figure out. So the first one is publish subscribe. Um, what we want to go after here is uh, we're going top down. So we have a client that connects and says they want to subscribe to a channel called Foo. And we have another client that wants to subscribe. And what's going to happen is at some later point, if another client comes along and says, I'm going to publish on the Foo channel this message, uh, we want to be able to write to every subscribed client for that channel, that message. Um, and then just to give you something a little more uh, concrete here, um, it's that same example that's um, actually using Real Redis and Real Redis CLI. So what you'll see here is I'm going to subscribe to two channels. Uh, and then on the third channel here, I'm going to publish. And the main thing I want you to see is when we publish in the bottom thing here, you should see the top two get the message. And that's what we're shooting for. So we're going to publish two messages. Here's the first one. You can see how both got that message, and then we do it again. And so then they both get the next message. So that's ideally what we're trying to implement here. So how do we do this? Um, if we remember that we had one transport and protocol per connection, we need something a little bit different. We need to be able to, from a given transport protocol pair, somehow communicate to other transports that are interested and write data to them. And what we're going to take advantage of is this protocol factory. So I showed you some async I.O. code where we were doing protocol factory and instantiating it. We're going to take advantage of that uh, in a second. But the actual pub sub part is pretty easy. We're going to create a new class. And whenever you call subscribe, we just have a dictionary of the channel name and a list of transports. So you give it your transport when you want to subscribe to something. And then the publish is equally um, straightforward. You look up the channel. You have a list of transports. And you iterate. For every transport and transports, you just call transport.write. Um, and hopefully that's, that's pretty straightforward. There's not really a lot of async co code there. It's actually pretty, um, pretty simple. And the way we integrate this, same thing. We're going back to our Redis server protocol. So in this command here, we're just calling our pub sub object dot describe. And notice we're passing our self dot transport. And then same thing with publish. So, so this part's pretty straightforward. Uh, the thing that was kind of tricky is, is how do we actually get all of this stuff wired up together? And so you remember this very first line we looked at, which is we're passing a class uh, object here, not the instance. We're going to change that slightly into a protocol factory. And, no, and now we're going to pass the factory to the create server. And all this is going to do is just store a reference to the class. And it's going to store args and keyword args to pass. So this is also basically like functools.partial, if you're familiar with that. This is just kind of making this a, a direct concept in, in the code. Um, so now, whenever this gets called, we're able to pass in a shared object. And so the thing that was useful for me here is that instead of having transport know about other transports and you know, having to coordinate all that, you just tell the PubSub object, and the PubSub manages which ones it needs to call out to. And so that, again, keeps your logic very simple, very easy to test. So that's publish subscribe. Last thing I want to look at, that's probably the most interesting one, is blocking list pops. So this is what we're shooting for. Um, I'm going to subscribe to BL pop, which is a blocking left pop. Uh, on the foo key, and zero is just a timeout, which means wait forever. So if I do that with two clients, notice I don't get a response right away. But now if another client comes along and does an R push on the foo list, I'm going to pick that value, the bar value, and send it to whatever client's been waiting the longest. So this is essentially like a queuing system, right? And again, just to give you something more concrete, um, we're going to do the same thing here. Create two clients. We're going to have um, both of them block. And we're going to publish two messages. And this time, you'll see one client gets the first message, and another client gets the second message. All right. 
So hopefully you get what we're shooting for. We only want to give it to one. So now we need to manage which one's been waiting the longest. So how do we do this? This one was um, also took me a little bit of time to figure out. wasn't intu intu wasn't intuitive to me. Um, but we're going to use the same idea where we're going to use a shared object. So this is a key blocker object. And the way we do this, we'll start at the bottom and kind of work our way up. So remember that database object, which is not supposed to know anything about async I/O. So what I did here was the same idea where, you know, if there's something in the list, we don't have to block. We return right away. But if there's something that we do have in the list, or if there's nothing in the list, then what we need to do is block. And instead of having the database object know how to block and start integrating and coupling async I/O code, it just returns some sentinel value that says um, you have to wait. Right? I don't have any data available. Whoever's calling me needs to figure out how to wait. And if you go up one level of the stack, we can see in our data received, same kind of thing here. Um, we're going to pass in our database and our key blocker in our loop. But here we're going to call blpop, same stuff as before. But if we get something that indicates we need to wait, this is kind of the new part where we're going to look at um, async and await here. So I'm going to call key blocker, this new object, dot wait for key. I'm going to get this, this thing back. Really, it's a coroutine. And then we're going to say loop.create task, this coroutine. So remember earlier I showed you um, we how the data received was a callback. And one of the important things there is that you cannot block that. If you block that uh, method, you block the entire event loop, right? And everything stops. So the best that we can do if we want to block for something is create a new task. So if you're familiar with threads or something, create, create a new thread conceptually and ask the event loop to run it. Um, and that thing can block. So that's essentially what we're doing here. We're creating a new coroutine, and we're asking the um, event loop to run that in its loop. OK. And then now that we have the corresponding you know, blocking part, we need the uh, push part. So whenever data comes into their push, we're going to tell the key blocker about it. Uh, and that's this part here where we're going to say, create a new task with data for key. And so now let's look at how the key blocker looks like. And so there's a couple of new things here. There's the new async and the new await stuff. And we'll go over how this works. Um, so the first part is the async def, wait for key. Um, this is new to Python 3.5. This is creating a native coroutine. And the, the important part here is that um, we're going to use an async io.q. So if you're familiar with the q.q um, that's used for multi-threaded um, in a multi-threaded scenario, it's kind of the same idea. And essentially what we're going to do is block. So we're going to say value equals await q.get. And what this is going to do in this coroutine is this is going to sit here and wait until there's actually data available. And because we're using uh, the async q, which gives us the FIFO semantics, it will unblock the one who's been waiting the longest, right? First in, first out. And so uh, once we get our value, we can then do the transport.write for that single, um, only that single transport. And, that, and then we have a corresponding thing for data for key. We don't technically need to use it. There's a q.putnoweight, uh, but I just wanted to show how you could also do that. OK. Uh, and I found async and await, while conceptually it's kind of easy, you just put like await where you would want to block normally. I wanted to know kind of how that worked. So here's a very, very high level um, overview of how async and await work. Um, so what's going to happen is we did the call soon, right, for our task. So we have wait for key happening in the event loop. So the event loop comes along and says, all right, we're going to call this method. And then remember, we called q.get. And one of the things that um, I found, I realized, was that whenever there is an await, somewhere deep buried in the guts of async I.O., there is a yield somewhere. That is the only way to stop Python code from executing and essentially save the state so you can resume it with a coroutine.send. Right? So there is a yield somewhere deep in, the, um, deep in async I.O. And at this point, we go all the way back up, thanks to the magic of yield from, and we have this object future. Um, doesn't really matter. This is kind of like the what it's called. But what happens at this point is this is essentially frozen. So the event loop knows about this call stack, and it's frozen. And then something else comes along when data actually is available for the key. And we say data for key, which is going to do the q.put. And that q.put is then going to have a value associated with it. And, and again, I'm kind of glossing over the details here to, to simplify things. But what's essentially going to happen is this is going to unlock the future. So this is going to say that this future is done, which will then schedule it to be run in the event loop. Then this value here goes over to the yield and resumes. And then now you get that value back from your q.get. So at a very high level, you can kind of see how that would work with this async and await here. That's essentially what's happening here. OK. So uh, that is basically how you would do blocking list pops. You do the same thing for a BL pop and BR pop from the end of the list. Um, there are a few additional considerations. There are things that I didn't really have time to cover um, that uh, actually changed a lot of how the internals work. So first thing, uh, the real parsing is more complicated. So I made a big assumption that we're getting all of the data as a single request. Um, realistically, you would get partial data. You would feed the parser, and it would tell you when it had a complete 
um, command for you to run, and you could potentially get more than one command if you're doing pipelining or that kind of thing. Uh, PubSub can handle clients disconnecting, right? So there's also another method on the, uh, the protocols that we didn't look at, connection lost, and that's how you can handle disconnecting. Um, and there's also like some advanced pattern matching, that kind of stuff. And then the last thing is that blocking queues can actually wait for multiple queues. So I can say BL pop, you know, foo and bar. And then when data is available on either of those, it will unblock. And so for that, I couldn't use an async io.queue. We actually had to go uh, a little more low level and use the async io.futures. OK, uh, last thing, performance. I was curious. So there's a Redis benchmark program you can run that comes with Redis. Um, these are the parameters I did, so just the basic set and get. And on my laptop, Redis server, we got about 82,000 uh, requests per second. For Pi Redis server, um, I got 24,000 initially. Uh, I was at um, Yuri's talk with, uh, he was talking about UV loop, so I thought, let's try it out, see how well it does. And just plugging UV loop with no changes brought it up to 38,000 requests per second, so I thought that was really cool. Um, we're you know, a little more than two times as slow. Um, very unoptimized code. Uh, when I profiled it, it was mostly in my parsing code, which you know can uh, be optimized quite a bit. It's inefficient how I'm doing parsing now. But I thought that was really cool. So we're pretty close. Um, so just a summary of what I covered here so far. Looked at transports and protocols, hopefully showed you a little bit more in depth how they work, how they pair to a single connection. Um, and then we looked at request response and then some other patterns for how we can share uh, state or how we can communicate state across various transports. So looking for publish, subscribe, and then blocking queue-like behavior. Um, so I'm going to put these slides uh, online. I don't know where they are, where they're going to be yet. And I don't, I'll put the code online as well. I don't have links. So I guess for now, um, I'll, I'll tweet them out eventually. Um, so that's probably the best place for more information. But uh, once again, thank you. Thank you very much, James, for this talk. We take a few questions. Hi, great talk. Why did you write your own path instead of using a pre-existing path? There's, for example, the high Redis path that's yep. a C interface to the C path of uh, Redis. Yep. Um, good question. Mostly just to see to see what the overhead would be, just kind of learn more about. I mean, mostly this was a project to learn more about um, how Redis would work and how to implement it. But I think if I was actually going for performance, that would be the next step is um, either try to clean up the parser myself or to just use the, the high Redis, which is the C library, to do the parsing um, for me. And I think that would get pretty close performance to, to the real Redis. So yeah, that's something I'd, I want to look into. OK, some more questions on the back. Hi, great talk. Uh, do you the do you make the tests with uh, arrays with persistence or not? Oh, you're, are you asking about if we persist the data to disk? Like yes, yes. Uh, so that's not something I'd looked at. Um, I don't actually know the best way to do that. So with Redis, it just does the fork and exec and then writes it in the background. Um, that would be my first attempt. It would to do some it would to be uh, to do something similar. Try just the fork exec and figure out the serialization, the RDB serialization, and see. Um, uh, how far that, how well that works with async IO, um, but I haven't actually tried it. Okay, thanks. Okay, one more, one last question. There it is. Uh, and what do you think about uh, async IO? Did you like it, the experience, or what's your conclusion of? So I think one of the biggest problems for me was just it was hard to figure out how to do things. And I think, you know, not coming from a background of writing a lot of async IO code, I think the docs, and I think I heard this mentioned earlier, you know, the, doc, the docs need a little bit of work. Um, it was not, I could understand how building blocks worked and how coroutines worked and tasks and all that, but I didn't really get how to fit things together. And I think just having more examples, um, having more documentation about that would really help. As far as the internals, I found it a little confusing. If for the people familiar with async IO, how you have futures and tasks, which really should be called like coroutine driver, and how that schedules things, and you get futures that then have callbacks, and the way that kind of works, I found that a little bit hard to understand. Um, I've been looking at some of the other ones. The other, I think, frameworks like Curio was one that seemed a lot simpler for me to understand. Um, but I think for me, the biggest problem is just having more examples of how to do things, and then it's a great framework. So yeah, thank you very much for your talk again. Give him a hand. Yeah.